The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of areas as black as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and theater. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Felicia Richard, renowned actress. Glad to have you with us today, Thank Felicia. Thank you. Now, we all do things in our life that we really want to do, and sometimes we just sort of fall into them. How did you get into acting? Oh, this is something I wanted to do since I was 11. That's like I wanted to be a pilot since I was nine. There you go. That's what, good. I, what I wanted to do. Now, how did you get the opportunity? Well, my mother created opportunities for me, as she did for the three of us, my, my siblings, yeah. Debbie and Tex, and my Tex. brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it was lessons at the Alley Theater's Merry-Go-Round Theater School. Now, where was that school? Houston, Texas. Now, it was during a time of segregation, was it? Or oh, was yes. Just, now, this was an African-American school. No. Well, how did you do that? I just went. Yeah, but, but, but <laughs> with the racism, did they want to exclude you or did they welcome you because of your parents or what? Well, it wasn't because of my parents. It was because I just went. At that time, it seemed that people in theater, it's some people in theater, some people on the artistic scene were uh, more inclusive in their thinking mm -hmm. than, let's say, people in other uh, sectors of, of the society, okay? And uh, Houston, um, for all of its cowboys and oil barons, uh, produced a lot of artists, a lot of jazz musicians, yeah, yeah great vocalists, uh, painters, uh, sculptors, and people in theater as well. The Alley Theater became known as one of the great regional theaters in our country later on. Mm -hmm. But at that time, it really was in a little theater in an alley. That's why they called it the Alley Theater. You had to walk down this little alley to get in there. It was, um, it was a theater in, well, <laughs> in the round, only it was square. <laughs> oh, uh. And, and uh, there was only one other theater in Houston, that was the Playhouse Theater. And during a time of segregation, my mother presented an evening of her poetry at the Playhouse Theater. There was a reading of, of uh, her book, Hawk, at the... So we were there. I, I was, you know, yeah, the only one, yeah, right. But still, I was there. That's the, the thing about being a trailblazer, in a sense, you're a trailblazer. Think about being a trailblazer. When you're doing it, you don't know you're a trailblazer. No. Of course, your parents also told you you could do anything you wanted to do. I'm sure of that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that was uh, true with a lot of middle-class black folks back in the days of segregation and early integration. Many of them thought that their children should have those opportunities that they had, but they should even do better. That's right. And you did better. Well, oh, I don't... I don't know if I did better, I did. By better, I meant in terms of <laughs> visibility and exposure and so on, because there's been so much talent in the black community that has not been exposed. This is true, but there's been talent that was exposed, but not like today, this mm -hmm. is true. I mean, um, Ira Aldrich, you know, the 19th century actor who, who, um, who was supposed to be going to seminary school <laughs> and told his father he wanted to be an actor instead. And he left and, and went to uh, Europe. And there was a lot of uh, segregation there, too, mm -hmm. much to the surprise of many people. We like to think that in that time, uh, Europeans were just beyond that. They were not. He went all over Europe performing Shakespeare speaking in English while the other actors spoke in whatever the language of the country was they were in at the time. There have been people who, who have transcended racism before and who've, they, those for me are the real um, trailblazers, like Sissy Aretta Jones, Black Patty, mm -hmm. with a four and a half octave range who performed before crown heads of Europe in in the 19th century, you know, early 20th century. They come here and, and had to do a troubadour show. Mm. But it, 
I don't know. I don't know. This thing about racism, racism is just, I've been over it for so long. Since I was nine, <laughs> since I was nine years old, I've been over racism, and I'll tell you why. I was in a supermarket. We went to the supermarket every week. And this was the time of Jim Crow laws. So they had these fountains. And one fountain said, for colored. Uh -huh. And the other fountain said, for whites only. Well, I was standing there looking at those fountains one day, and curiosity got the best of me. I wanted to know what that water tasted like that was for whites only. <laughs> Very it had good. to be different, you know. So I walked over to the fountain and turned it on, and I drank the found the water from the whites only fountain and it tasted the same and when I tasted that water and it tasted the same I said oh okay you know I understood I understood that humanity had tricked itself and I was just over it I said I'm done I'm just done this is dumb I'm done <laughs> well that's a mindset I, I'm sure your parents had something to do with it I'm sure my, my mother had everything to do with it I'm sure they had <laughs> so no barriers there everything to do with it. my mother my mother <laughs> was determined that her children would not be scarred by racism so she would do everything that she could to prevent it so this is what she did when there was some place that we wanted to go and couldn't because of Jim Crow laws she wouldn't tell us it was because of segregation or Jim Crow laws mm -hmm. she would say um, well, we can't go there because it's, it's a private club, mm -hmm. and we're not members of that club. So we said, oh, okay, we're not members of that club, so we can't go there. We would do other things. Uh, she would um, bring all the neighborhood kids in and teach us choral speech, or she would move the living room furniture to the side and teach us how to tumble. Uh, or she would um, teach us Catherine Dunham dance combinations going across the floor. Or she'd teach us to play um, the organ or the piano. She would give us other things, creative things to do. And when you're engaged in creative activity, it's you and creativity. It's you mm -hmm. and the art. It's you and whatever that is that's really giving you access to your own self. Now, where did she get that? She said as a little girl in Chester, South Carolina, she used to sit in the swing in the front yard and go as high as she could go, looking up at the sky, dreaming big dreams. And one of the big dreams is she's as good or better than everybody else around. She didn't even think about it like that. She just thought, she was looking at the sky, and the sky was the limit, and it was big. <laughs> a child, you know, children are very creative. And as a child, she thought that way. My mother had great love for music and poetry, and she was being educated at Brainerd Institute. Brainerd Institute was one of those um, schools founded by the Presbytery, mm -hmm. the Freedmen's Bureau for the descendants of Africans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we had such schools um, throughout uh, South Carolina on into Mississippi. She was receiving a classical education and she was being educated by teachers who expected nothing but excellence from all of their students. So that's what she did. And she was growing up in a mill town, Chester, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what we expect of young people. Uh, it's what, what young people are exposed to, literature, reading, art, theater, history, science. It's exposure. Yeah, one of the things that I talk about in my talks about the Tuskegee Airmen and what we achieved, it has to do with expectations. Mm. If you expect that you can be as good or better than anybody else, you will. Not everybody will, but a certain large number will. And out of that generation of your mother and your father and so on, great people have emerged and great opportunities have developed. But then I think about today. Mm -hmm. Today, many of our young people are trapped, mm -hmm. trapped in a circle of hopelessness and despair 
because they have not been projected the opportunities, expectation. That's partially a result of the integration and loss of black teachers and black role models. In the arts, I know that you and your colleagues do a lot with young people mm -hmm. to help them to feel that they can do something. All young people. Now, where, where do you think that, 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 that is going now? Do you think that because of the new modes of communication, uh, the internet, Facebook, uh, rap, and so on, th there's some movement away from the search for excellence? Well, things have become more immediate, you know. At the snap of a finger, everything's in the palm of your hand, or so it seems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so illusory, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Just, there it is. There it is, yeah. No, baby, no, it's not there. Um, the world is different today, and yet it is the same. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Now, you, and you, uh, being a featured performer, and everybody knows you, you see that on both sides. When they don't know you're a featured performer, you're just another person of color. But when you're a featured performer, you're treated in a different way. Now, how do we get past that? And that, that's really the eternal question. How do you get past evil? But how do you get past that? Well, I've, I think I'm never... <laughs> I, I don't ever see myself in a position of controlling how other people think or how other people view me. That's just never going to happen. I think what's most important is how I see myself. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's most important. And what I know of myself, my true self, I think that's what's important. Everything else is just everything else. It isn't necessarily what's really real. People see you in one light or another depending on the way they think and the way they see. It has nothing to do with the truth of who you really are. So I think it's important to know one's own self, you know, beyond uh, ethnicity, beyond mm -hmm. nationality, beyond gender, certainly beyond social and economic status. Who am I? Who am I really? Where do I come from? Why am I here? What am I doing? <laughs> but you see, the roles that you play and other actors and actresses play as black people portray a certain image of us, like you know what we did with Cosby, what we did with uh, the, the uh, Negro Ensemble, they play an image of us. And people learn about black culture through what you and I and others do. Yes. Then the question is, how do you select what you do? Do you select the roles you play or do you accept roles that are brought to you? Um, both. Mm -hmm. You gotta pay the bills. <laughs> both, yeah. That, well, that's the nature of, of the work itself. Mm -hmm. There's some things that you set your mind to do and you set out to do, like let's say The Old Settler, mm -hmm. a play that, was, that I optioned that my sister and I co-produced as a film for PBS. Mm -hmm. That was something that I said, we got to do this. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, we got to do this. And we did. Um, other work, like Aunt Esther and August Wilson's Gem of the Ocean, that was something that was presented mm -hmm. to me. Um, Claire Huxtable and Ruth Lucas were presented to me. You always have the choice of saying yes or no. Who's going to say no to such wonderful work? Mm -hmm. Not me. Mm -hmm. There was a time, I'll tell you, earlier in my career when I was just maybe mm, two to three years out of Howard University. I was, um, I was in Los Angeles for the first time. And I was meeting um, a casting director and agents and people like that. And this gentleman looked at me. He said, you know... You're just too, uh, um, you're too sophisticated to play a whore. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought to myself, okay, <laughs> okay, you know, all righty then. Um, hmm. And I thought, hmm, oh, this is how it's done. This is how, this is the way you're thinking when you're casting people who look like me. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Let me go back to the theater where I can do some real work and I'll let y'all get it together. <laughs> and so I turned right back around, came back to my munchkin stool on Broadway and continued my sojourn through the theater because work in theater was so creative. It was a wonderful time with the Negro Ensemble Company, wonderful work being done there. Wonderful work at the New Federal Theater. Wonderful work with Woody King. Wonderful, wonderful work being done. Vanette Carroll had the Urban Arts Corps. You know, th there was just, you could go and work. And that was what was important, just to work. And then everything else came later. When, um, when um, I was auditioning for Mr. Cosby, who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew what that would, uh, I didn't know, he knew, I didn't know. I didn't even think about it. Um, in, the, in the eight years, I never thought about anything except how wonderful it was to work, mm -hmm. you know, and to work with him, and how my years in theater had served me well in working with him. Um, it's so good to pay dues and to uh, do that groundwork in whatever your profession is, you know, so that you're really developed in whatever it is that you're choosing to do instead of having it in the palm of your hand right away. Well, that's true. You had your mother and your father and your family, mm -hmm. but there must have been some other people who gave you the guidance and direction and support who were some of those people? Oh, yes, thank you. There were other people. There were people at Howard University. There was James Butcher, Gretchen Gordon, Vera Katz. And then when I came to New York, well, when I came to New York... Was it Woody? He never talked to me a lot. Gilbert Moses. Gil Moses, yeah. Gilbert Moses um, was the first... Well, Vinette Carroll was the first top-notch director that I worked with. Gilbert Moses was the second, and he was higher up on the rung. Um, but even before that, when I was a student at Howard University, Allie Woods, who was a member of the Negro Ensemble Company and from Houston, Texas, my hometown, mm -hmm. invited me to come to New York for the summer after my sophomore year. And it was that summer, that summer, that really set me on my path. What happened that summer? I saw a professional company of African-American artists who were the best. Francis Foster, Esther Rowe, mm -hmm. Moses Gunn, uh, uh, Doug Turner, Norman Bush, uh, Douglas Turner Ward, that is. No, I'm trying to remember everybody. David Downing, Judy Ann Johnson, Hattie Winston, Denise Nicholas. Come on. I mean, does it get better? Richard Ward, does it get better than this? I don't think so. Allie Woods, does it get better than this? I don't think so. And there were two plays in repertory. There was The Song of Lusitanian Bogey uh -huh. and Daddy Goodness. So, as a Howard University student who had just completed her sophomore year in the College of Fine Arts. Every night, I sat in the theater of the St. Mark's Playhouse. St. Mark's Playhouse on 8th Street. And I watched a performance of one of those plays, whatever was playing that night. Every night for the entire summer, I watched them. And I watched them. And I determined that one day I would be like them. One day I, too, would be a good, solid, See, I was the uh, chairman of the board of the Negro Ensemble Company about that time. Mm. And it was just wonderful to see all these great 
budding young black actors and actresses were coming to open. You name everybody in theater. They came at one time mm -hmm. through the Negro Ensemble Company That's or right. through the New Federal Theater. That's right. So the thing that I think about now is who's doing that for young African Americans today? What kind of opportunities do they have? We got the media, we got the rap, we got the music, got the videos, but who's helping them to gain those professional skills that you and your generation have? Well, Woody King is still at it. He's still there. He had his 40th anniversary. We had him on the show he's talking about that. It. God love him. He's still at it, and that's a good thing. And uh, Marie Thomas is over in New Jersey with the Peppermint Players, and she's developing young actors. She's been doing this for a couple of decades yeah. now, and it's a, it's a task that, um, I don't know how she does it, but she, every single year, she's, and she's using theater and theater arts to teach different things. And she's developing, not only artists, but she's developing fine human beings. So there are people who are doing this work. My sister, Debbie, my sister Debbie has uh, the Debbie Allen Dance Academy mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and her dancers are, well, they are first place winners in European contests, okay? <laughs> they, and her faculty looks like a mini United Nations, uh -huh. and uh, she, she goes beyond the walls of her school to teach in public schools, to go into areas to bring dance to young people. And, she, and it doesn't matter. The, the size and shape of the physique is of no importance to her. Mm -hmm. She's going to let everybody dance. And, and they do. They do. <laughs> they, <laughs> do. they do. At um, the site of Brainerd Institute, which is now part of our family, um, I made a gift of it to my mother's 501c3 organization, ADEPT. And um, she has developed, my mother's name is Vivian Ayers, I have to say that. Otherwise, she says, what am I, just your mother? I'm not a person. <laughs> no, Vivian, you are a person. So uh, on, the, on the site of, of Brainerd, um, which is being restored for educational and uh, cultural programming, every year, Debbie comes with her faculty. And there is a three-day two to three day festival of dance in which there is free uh, instruction offered in ballet, jazz, tap, modern, African, and hip hop. And the people come from far and wide of all ages. In a ballet class, I'm not kidding you, in a ballet class, they range from age three to 80. Now, that, that's what we call giving back. Mm. A lot of folks give back. A lot of celebrities and people in the community give back. The arts itself, though, tends to talk about the culture, the society, mm -hmm. human needs, mm -hmm. human emotions. Mm -hmm. And they cover the span regardless of race, gender, location, or whatever. How do you think African Americans are perceiving the world through the arts that they see today, as presented on the stage, music, television. How do you think African Americans are seeing the world through the arts? Well, it depends on what they're seeing and where they're seeing it. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> if, true. If you're if you're looking at uh, Kenny Leon's um, True Colors Theater in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and seeing the work that he's directing on the Broadway stage, which is tr tremendous and great work, that's a few pictures right there. If you're seeing the work of the Penumbra Theater in um, St. Paul, mm -hmm. that's another great work. If you're seeing the work at Ebony Repertory Theater Company in Culver City, California, that's another great work. Or at the uh, Pasadena Playhouse, where Sheldon Epps is the artistic director, you're seeing great work. There are theater companies, um, some smaller than others, that find their way. And with these companies, part of these companies, well, part of what they do is education. 
and they do it. You don't hear about it a lot. That's true. You just don't hear about it, but it is happening. The Riverside Theater right here in right New York here, City. You know, they're, they're the Dwyer Cultural Center of Rosa Rivers, right see, here in New York. Right here in New York City, but you don't hear about it. What you hear about is some other things, some that, other I, things. that I just can't, I just, you know. Well, as we come to the close of the show, a question I know you've been asked many times. What was your favorite role of all the roles you've ever done? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <sighs> That's hard. I know it's hard because you've done so many great roles. Yeah. You could say all of them. <laughs> I could say all of them, and I'd be telling the truth except for maybe one or two. <laughs> uh, right. Except there are a couple there's of them. There's always one. There's a couple of them. I thought, ooh. <laughs> well, look, I'll tell you what. I'll let you off the hook on that. Thank you. I, I want to thank you for being with us on today's African-American legend. You truly are an African-American legend. And we were talking about things that will help some other people who are watching this, some younger people, to become legends as well. Today on African-American Legends, we've been talking with Felicia Richard, renowned actress. Thanks for being with us today, Felicia. Thank you.